Yeah, th this is the third uh, special uh, we've done with Cirque du Soleil Image for, uh, for the Cirque du Soleil. The first one, Kidam in Amsterdam, followed by Dralian in San Francisco. And I think the most interesting challenge uh, is trying to marry the, the disciplines of television, uh, which is often not that disciplined uh, an area, uh, with the super discipline and attention to detail of the, the Cirque. And I think that's forced everybody involved to really raise their game uh, beyond their metal. Because hopefully, I hope that the four or five months of preparation should eventually be um, successful and we should be ready. But there's always last minute kind of thing, as you know. A lot of the time people will say, well, how do you take that magic that Cirque du Soleil of the live show and translate it into the other mediums. Uh, how can you take something that's such a grand scale and put it onto a little TV screen? Well, the answer, of course, is we can't recreate that same magical experience, but what we can do is design something specifically for the medium and that audience. In the case of our television specials, uh, and hopefully you've just seen this one, uh, you'll see that we take our audience right to the heart of the performance. We're able to, to go with 13 cameras and more into the emotional expression of our artists. Uh, we're able to show the physicality uh, and we're able to bring a whole new dimension that works very powerfully on, on a television screen. It's going to rise next. Nice. Okay. We want the experience of filming it to be like you're in the best seat of the house for every part of the show. And sometimes it's good to be down the front and sometimes it's good to be at the sides because the show is designed to be an experience for everybody in the big top. Josh, you're here on the left. So let's throw the thing into the air and catch it. There are two options. One, to put 30 cameras in the show in one night which would be a bit impractical and also would destroy the atmosphere. People would just be surrounded by cameras. So what we actually do is bring in a lesser number of cameras, 13 cameras in fact, and distribute them over a couple of nights. Let's get that nice detail. And uh, somehow, out of all this mixture of shots that you can see behind me, we create something that hopefully becomes a moving and dramatic experience to watch. And one of the major, major pain for a shoot like that is to control and manage box office uh, audience seatings because of the camera position, because of the extra lighting position. So uh, the, the, uh, the real challenge is to make sure that you have the director to get the perfect shot, but at the same time, we have to make sure that the customer who paid almost 100 bucks for their tickets are not going to be too annoyed by the presence of cameras uh, in the big tub. I mean, the circuit are very concerned about that. If somebody's show is at all uh, being spoilt by cameras, they're seriously upset. So we've had to be very sensitive and uh, in fact we've you know, dug holes in the ground to put the cameras rather than have the cameras in front of somebody. And that's the main technical problem is how can we make this a brilliant show for the audience and therefore get the atmosphere that feeds the performers and therefore get a great video and not spoil it by the fact that our cameras are there. getting everything ready, budgeting, scheduling, um, make sure that everybody on tour is aware of what we're doing, um, get their collaboration, which was, in fact, very easy because they were all very, very enthusiastic. For the filming, we wanted to respect what we have in the show on a daily basis. Uh, so what you will see on the video is actually what you will See if you come to see the show live under the big tap. Allegria is one of our, I think it's the only touring show that has never been shot uh, for television or film. So uh, it was a great challenge and it was also a great thing for them to have us here. Uh, and it showed. This is really good fun, you know, and we generally we do rock concerts, big rock concerts and television shows and some dance and some ballet. And, 
And although it's always interesting working with different groups of people and going to foreign capital cities, this is so different for us. I do know that for most of the crew I bring from England on these, it's uh, probably the highlight of their year, uh, and they do live and breed the surf. And it's a fascinating uh, exercise to see two different cultures come together. There's this whole childhood thing of running away and joining the circus and being in the big top. And, and uh, you know, Luke says we've done this for three years now and we hope to keep on doing this. No reason why we shouldn't do one of these a year for the next five years. And it's a big high point for us, for, for me, certainly for the, of the year, you know, to go off to some fabulous city and work with the circus for two weeks is very romantic. Well, logistically, yeah, it's just a matter of all the extra equipment that came onto the site, the extra generators that came on, all the loading of the equipment into the big top, and feeding of the extra people. So uh, we have our kitchen on site here, as you know, that feeds all of our staff. So we told the kitchen chef, it's just gonna be an extra 65 people for a few meals, so don't worry about it. Up or down? Both. Thank you. Do we have both? Ah, the film crew. The film crew's been very good to us. We've been dealing with the film crew, getting lights adjusted for the show. It's a little bit different for film than it is for live theater. We've gradually changed the lighting so that it's suitable for TV. We've gradually introduced the artists into the environment of what it's going to be like when they get filmed so they don't just walk in and suddenly there's five times more lights than there were before. We've brought the artists in during the day to see where the cameras are going to be in that evening so they can adjust their performance and not, and not suddenly have surprises. And the whole thing is very much a collaboration between the Cirque du Soleil and the TV crew. It's not as it often is, it's wham bam and it's all over and, and, the, t and the people, the performers go, what was that all about? With this, there's so much going on stage. There's characters that you wouldn't even notice if you've seen the show maybe three times doing things. That's why I think 75% of the audience who see it one time when it comes to Sydney come back the next time. And I think that's because there's so much in it. And as a TV director, that's really a challenge for me to try and make sure that nothing that people have noticed over the years of seeing Allegria is missing from this video. And that's why it has to be a collaboration. also bringing in uh, local crew, local companies, uh, and getting them to fit in with now how we work with the Cirque. Uh, so far, Australia's been a, a, a very pleasant experience, I have to say, with, with Super Cruise. TV cameras aren't as sensitive as the human eye. In the human eye, you come out from bright, sunny Sydney, and you step into this dark tent, and the whole magic begins, and you sort of get used to the slightly dimmer lights and these characters in very strange clothes come out of the darkness and entertain you. Unfortunately, if you bring TV cameras in, it just turns into a dark experience and that's no fault of the search. They're, they're lighting for human eyes. You have a show that Luke created, a, a lighting design for the show, which is very beautiful and works perfectly for an audience of 2,000 people. But if you film the show, there are a whole different set of parameters that, that you have to take account of before you can have something that appears halfway decent on the television screen. Of course, the concept that, uh, that I developed seven years ago for Alegria is not something that's going to work well for a film or for television, so it really needs to be um, rethought and to a certain extent redesigned. Luke's role as the original lighting designer is to be here to make sure that the show that ends up on the television screen is basically his show. But like all kind of creative collaborations, though we have these quite specific responsibilities, the thing is very loose in the end, and often, you know, one of us will be making a suggestion as to how this works, and the other person will be. They call us the Teletubbies, we all sit here. Patrick and Sudi and Dave seem to have really grasped the, the intention behind uh, the, uh, the design. You know, that it was uh, it's kind of, you know, incandescent, late 19th century, su uh, suggestive of autumn and fall and, you know, very deep, tarnished amber colors. And I think that 
if the guys get a sense of that, then the, the transformation, because it is in fact a transformation, can only be a, a successful one. It's gone rather well. Of course, it's always a matter of uh, adjusting, and you know, we're adjusting back and forth. I adjust to the needs for television lighting, and of course, every once in a while, I throw in my two cents worth about uh, colors and uh, the feel, and everyone has been quite receptive, so it's gone rather well. And just working with another lighting designer, working with Luke, you know, who sees things in a very different way than uh, I would see them. You know, you learn an enormous amount of of uh, kind, kind of inspirational stuff that you think about the next time you do a show. Oh, well, he saw it that way. I would never have thought of doing that. And then you learn from that. It's interesting. And certainly uh, the tremendous difference between what's really happening on stage and then the end result on, uh, on film. It's fascinating.